Welcome to Space News from Ad Astra. I'm Swapna Krishna. Today, we are going to talk about an air leak on the International Space Station, evidence of the first stars in our universe, the woes of the Mars sample return mission, and disappointing news from Jupiter's moon Europa. Let's start with news you never want to hear. There is an air leak aboard the International Space Station, and it's getting worse. It's important to note a couple of things. First, the astronauts are not in danger, nor is the spacecraft, and this is a leak we have been aware of for a while. But now it's getting worse, according to the manager of the ISS program for NASA. This is from a briefing on Crew 8. Um, we've been watching the, the leak rate. of the. There's an area in the aft end of the International Space Station that we've seen a leak. On a small uh, leak, we have saw that leak increase. The leak is on the Russian side in the Zvezda service module, in a vestibule located between the docking port and the module. Roscosmos and NASA have been monitoring the air leak for some time, but it's increasing. It's now at a rate of 0.9 kilograms of lost air per day. But the good news is that it's not super urgent because this section can be sealed off from the rest of the ISS and only needs to be accessed when there's a spacecraft docking or undocking with the module. The Russian Progress cargo spacecraft arrived and docked with the Zvezda module on February 16th, and the leak increased about a week before this launch and docking. The hatch was open for five days to allow the space station crew to unload the capsule. After that, it was closed again, and it won't be reopened till early April. For some context, it is important to remember how old some parts of the International Space Station are. Zvezda launched on July 25th, 2000, and was the third module of the ISS. It's old. This isn't personal for anyone who remembers when Zvezda launched. Humans age much better than spacecraft. It was originally designed as part of the Mir-2 space station, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia partnered with the United States on the ISS and they repurposed it. It's 1980s tech built in the 1990s. It's not surprised that it's a bit leaky at this point, and this isn't the first leak we found in Zvezda. But also, it's an integral part of space station. Among other things, it provides life support for up to six crew members. So we're monitoring it, and right now there's nothing that needs to be done. However, if the leak does continue to grow, it definitely might become an issue. On to JWST news. One of the coolest things this observatory is doing is helping us learn about the early universe. Recently, scientists studied the exceptionally luminous galaxy GNZ11 as it existed just 430 million years after the Big Bang. Remember, looking deep out into space is like looking back in time because of the time it takes that light to reach us. They may have found evidence for Population 3 stars, the early stars of our universe, that we've theorized about but never directly detected. The research will be published in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, but a preprint is available now. According to the conventional wisdom, Population 3 stars are made up of only primordial gas, hydrogen and helium, because heavier elements didn't exist at the time they were created. They're incredibly massive, luminous, and they burn very hot. These stars produced heavy metals and then died. So when Population 2 stars were created from the leftover material, they contained more heavy metals. Our sun is considered a Population 1 star. This galaxy was first imaged by Hubble in 2016, and now, thanks to JWST, the team discovered a clump of pristine helium in the halo surrounding the galaxy. This is something that scientists have theorized about but never directly observed. They think that these clumps of pristine primordial helium are what collapsed to form Population 3 stars. The next step is to continue to study this galaxy and other massive early galaxies to see if they can find other evidence of Population 3 stars. In rocket news, we have a launch date for SpaceX's next Starship test. Last week I discussed how the FAA had closed its investigation into the Starship launch on November 18th. That was the second test launch of this mega rocket. Now, SpaceX has announced that their third attempt will be the morning of March 14th. They will live stream that attempt on their website. The last flight terminated soon after the first stage separation, so the goal, of course, for this is to accomplish the full test. That will include the splashdown of Starship in the Indian Ocean instead of the Pacific Ocean, as was the intention on previous tests, according to SpaceX's website. Jonathan McDowell posted this really excellent map on X of the trajectory. 
SpaceX is still waiting on a launch license from the FAA, so this launch could shift if that isn't issued in a timely fashion. We'll see what happens, but next week I will be publishing a preview video of Starship generally, as well as a breakdown of what happens during the mission whenever it launches. Next, let's talk about some recent headlines. You may have seen some news freaking out that Jupiter's moon Europa has less oxygen than we thought and may not be habitable. You might be wondering, wait, a moon in our solar system is habitable? Let me break down exactly what this research said, what scientists thought previously, and whether it is actually a huge disappointment. First, let's talk about why scientists think Europa might be habitable. Specifically, while it might have resources we can use for some sort of outpost or base, Europa is not habitable for humans in any traditional sense. When you see all of these headlines about one of Jupiter's moons being habitable, they mean that the moon has, number one, a subsurface ocean of liquid water, organic materials deposited from asteroids, Three, energy, this case from Jupiter's radiation blasting the surface and not the sun in our case. Stability, meaning the ocean has been there for a long time, approximately four billion years. This means that Europa might harbor life generally, not that it's habitable for humans. Between being blasted by Jupiter's radiation and the fact that the warmest temperatures on the surface are only about negative 210 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 134.4 degrees Celsius, we're not talking about humans moving to Europa and finding sandy beaches and balmy weather, but there might possibly be life in these subsurface oceans. So now this news put a little bit of a damper on that idea. The research basically says that Europa produces much less oxygen than we previously thought. The results were published in the journal Nature Astronomy. Because Europa's surface is predominantly water ice, scientists thought that it might produce abundant oxygen, which is necessary for any life as we know it to develop. Using data from the Juno mission, scientists looked at the hydrogen data from Juno's flight through one of the water plumes ejected into space by Europa. They were able to calculate the amount of oxygen the moon produces and came up with over 1,000 tons per day, or somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 tons per second. That does sound like a lot, but it's significantly less than the over 2,000 pounds per second that some previous studies predicted. But it is important to note that life could still exist in Europa's subsurface oceans at these levels. This team will continue to study Europa's data, and NASA's Europa Clipper mission, which will study the moon in depth when it arrives in 2030, is currently scheduled to launch in October of this year. Have you ever wondered what the great space observatories are looking at right this second? Thanks to a new tool from NASA, now you'll know. What is Webb observing and what is Hubble observing? Both allow you to look at what's currently being observed, how long the observation is, when the next one is, and details of the current observation. They've loaded data for all of JWST's observation into this tool, so you can also go back to its first science. Here's what was going on at the site at the time of this filming. You can see what JWST is currently looking at, what it's studying, in this case exoplanet formation, the previous target, and observation details, such as the instrument and even the research proposal it's tied to. There's so much information here in a nice, pretty package. You can also see a really nice picture of what the observatory is studying with the ability to zoom in and out. It's important to note that while you can see some cool photos in this viewing target area, the pictures you are seeing aren't real-time observations. This data has to be processed before it's released to the public. But remember, if it's raw JWST images you want to see, you can do that at the Space Telescope Science Institute's website. Okay, let's talk about the red planet for a minute. One of the things the Perseverance rover is doing on Mars is diligently collecting samples of the Martian surface for eventual retrieval. This is called the Mars Sample Return Mission, and it's in trouble. The plan basically is supposed to be to send a robotic lander to the Jezero Crater, which is where Perseverance is, in 2028. Two helicopters, like the now defunct Mars Ingenuity, would retrieve the samples and bring them back to the lander. After they were all collected, the lander would send them into orbit where they'd rendezvous with another spacecraft that would bring them home in 2033-ish. Ambitious, right? We've been hearing for a while about the extraordinary expense of the Mars Sample Return Mission. A report from the Office of the NASA Inspector General revealed that the $4 billion budget for the project is wildly low. Instead, NASA's portion of the expense, it's a joint mission with the European Space Agency, would be between $8 billion and $11 billion. 
The report also states that there's no way that the mission could really launch before 2030. The program has been under threat of cancellation by Congress for a while. Earlier this year, NASA's JPL had to lay off 530 people because of the lower than anticipated funding for Mars sample return. Now the 2024 Congressional Appropriations Committee budgets are out, they were released March 3rd. It doesn't cancel the program, but it does highlight concerns and schedule slips and chides NASA for laying off workforce without consulting Congress. Now we're in a holding pattern until an independent review board finishes auditing the mission and delivers recommendations. Mars sample return is a very important, huge priority for planetary science. But NASA has competing priorities and not everything can get fully funded. I'm crossing my fingers because Mars sample return would be such a cool mission, but we will see what happens here. China, meanwhile, is on a quest to get its Taikonauts to the moon, and the country is making a big step towards that goal next year. They're planning on launching two reusable rockets, according to Space News. There's a bit of a space race going on right now. China has pledged to put Taikonauts on the moon by 2030, and NASA's under a bit of pressure to complete its first Artemis landing, currently scheduled for no earlier than September 2026 with Artemis 3. Before that happens, with the delays that are plaguing the Artemis program, it's not clear who will be first. If you're wondering why NASA is struggling to return to the moon when we accomplish it with Apollo, I published a video on that. China's launch schedule is very aggressive. The country plans to launch 100 rockets next year, an increase of 40% over their current cadence, according to Bloomberg News. That would put them behind only SpaceX for the number of launches per year. This week, two Taikonauts performed some routine maintenance of their Tiangong space station, including maintaining the solar panels. Speaking of moon missions, NASA opened applications for its next class of astronauts this week. The requirements are pretty general. Be a U.S. citizen, have a master's degree in a STEM field, have completed a minimum of three years of professional work after being awarded that degree, and be able to pass a NASA physical. Pilots can also apply if they have a thousand pilot and command hours with at least 850 of those hours in a high performance jet aircraft. If that is you, then go ahead and apply on NASA's website. The last application class was 2021 and NASA chose 11 astronaut candidates out of over 12,000 applicants. That astronaut class graduated this year, which is why the applications are open again. And that is all the news I have for you this week. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.